Hello, Sophia here. I'm wondering if you've ever been curious about what it's like to work with a fashion stylist or what a sex club is like for someone in a fat body or what are the weight neutral approaches to PCOS treatment or what I thought about the Aubrey Gordon, Your Fat Friend film. Well, over on the Fat Joy newsletter, I am sharing these personal stories and practical strategies for living in our diet culture world. When you subscribe for free, you'll get an email from me about twice per month. Um, I'm also recording video conversations with incredible fat people, as well as amazing fat allies. And I want to share these people with you. So if you want some more Fat Joy, please go to Joy dot substack dot com. That is fat joy f a t j o y dot substack s u b s t a c k dot com, and subscribe to get all of this fat joy goodness in your inbox. Okay, enjoy the rest of the episode. Hello, lovelies. Welcome to the Fat Joy Podcast, where we talk each week about how to flourish in an anti-fat world. I'm Sophia Apostle, a fat professional coach who loves talking to other fat people about what it's like to live within oppressive systems that marginalize our bodies and how we still dare to have the audacity and courage to reach towards our collective liberation and embrace our joy. Please know this is an adult content podcast, so there will be swears. We will be talking about harms we've experienced, and we will be rebelling against weight stigma, diet culture, fat phobia, ableism, racism, etc. You can get more Fat Joy goodness, including how you can support the podcast through my newsletter at fatjoy.substack.com. And for episode transcripts, book reviews, and show notes, head to the Fat Joy website at fatjoy.life. I am so glad you're here. Enjoy this episode. Hello, lovelies. Welcome back to the Fat Joy podcast. I, of course, am Sophia, and I'm joined by someone that I have followed online, specifically Instagram, for a while. Um, someone whose content I find so useful, so helpful, um, and is doing amazing work in the world. So today I have with me Tiana Dodson. Hi, Tiana. Hi, Sophia. Thank you for this lovely little intro. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was so excited when you said yes to chatting because I think, um, I know for me in my early days journey as well as my continued journey, I mean, are we ever done being liberatory minded? No. Um, I found so much um, help, support, motivation, reminders from people like you and the content being shared, those little squares of messages and mini videos. I, I really showed me that I wasn't alone. And you've, you've got beautiful, beautiful, informative, thought provoking content. And I just, I just want you to know, like, it's so appreciated because I think a lot of times we put stuff out on Instagram and, it's a bit voidy, like it's like, okay, unless people are actively messaging you, which I imagine happens, but we all know like more people see it than comment, right? And so I just want to let you know, like it has been seen, heard and felt. So thank you for that. I appreciate that acknowledgement so much because I mean, you are correct about like how putting things out into the world onto social media really, really, really feels like I just tossed this this thing that I feel so passionately about just out into space and did did it did it resound did it hit anything I have no idea um and like also considering the fact that we are slaves to the social media algorithms when we do this kind of thing when we use these platforms there's no guarantee that the people that you're aiming for are actually going to hear or see or receive what you're sending and so it is super affirming and very very helpful to hear that yeah it's happening yeah it is it is yeah i i agree it is happening so tiana why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself who are you what do you do in the world for those who don't know you already 
these are beautiful questions. And I think they're also really hard questions because there's a lot of different ways to go with them. But um, I'm just, you know, I am a person. Um, and I know that, like, that's sort of like a, yeah, okay, of course you are. You're talking, we can hear you. But I think that that's the thing is, like, when you're somebody who is a public figure, quote unquote, online, you aren't a person per se anymore. You are, like, you you become who you, who you are. You become your title. You become this kind of uh, pedestal sort of situation. And I'm, like, like... No, no, I'm a person. <laughs> like, like, um, I am in a human gross body the same way everybody else is. When I wake up in the morning, my mouth is stinky, just like everybody else is. I must brush my teeth in order to be functional, you know. Um, and and like, I have to eat food. I poop just like everybody else. No, you don't. You, know. you don't poop. <laughs> exactly. It stinks. It sucks um like you know i've got all the squishy parts on the inside as well as the squishy parts on the outside because i'm a fat person um and like i'm just like a human being trying to just make it to the other side you know um of all of the garbage that's in between that's standing between where we're at right now and a place where like literally fat joy and just joy abundance exists um so all of that to say yeah i'm a fat person <laughs> i'm biracial um i'm black and chamorro so my mother comes from the island of guam um and uh like yeah i, I grew up in the united states uh raised in colorado springs colorado i live in europe which is a strange thing <laughs> considering my trajectory like you would have never expected me to land here um but yeah that's where i live uh i was in france for a few years and i've been in germany for more years than that um i have an eight-year-old kid as this recording um who just recently started saying things like mama i'm on a break i can't do that which is wild to hear out of the mouth of a child and i'm not sure if i should like be like yeah this is a total parenting win or like what's going on here you know <laughs> like uh it's both and isn't it um and i'm also just like yeah i'm a queer person who's out here asking questions like i try never to take anything at face value and um I will ruin things for you because I will ask the questions <laughs> that are inconvenient and unfun to think about. But like, you know, everything's problematic if you think about it deeply enough. So yeah, that's me, I guess, in a nutshell, somehow. Beautiful. Yeah, I'm just sinking into that. I love the way you answered that because it is, it feels fulsome as opposed to this is what I do in the world. It's like, hang on, let's start with, I'm a human who is bumbling towards joy and abundance through the garbage. <laughs> like that, I love that. I may, I may start answering questions of that nature in that way. Like, what do you do? Oh, I'm just a human bumbling towards some semblance of joy through garbage. Because that feels really, I mean, it, it's true. It feels so true. And some days I'm at the bottom of the garbage pile and other times I have found a little plateau and I'm breathing clean air. And it just really depends. Yeah. Yeah. I love that, Tiana. Um, so let's talk about fatness as well now. So what is your relationship to the word fat? How has it evolved over the years? Obviously, it's really central with the work that you do in the world. But I imagine like for so many of us, it was a real journey to get there. So can you tell us a little bit about that journey? Absolutely. Um, I've been fat pretty much my whole life. And like, I say pretty much because of course, a lot of the conception of when fat begins or like the fat identity or being identified as fat begins has a lot to do with like, the culture and the situation and the environment that you're growing up in. But my first real memories uh, that like are really like tangible for me about being labeled 
and understanding, so specifically understanding that I am fat or I am being called fat and it is a bad thing. I was about eight years old. Um, and so back then, you know, it was it was a failure. It was a problem. It was a it was a bad thing that I was fat. Um, and so basically, I did lots of dieting stuff, like not understanding how to diet or what have you. Um, and I do have to say that I am lucky in so far as I did not have like direct parental or caregiver influence that was assigning me to dieting. Um, it was simply that like my mom was dieting and she had a larger body and I was just doing what she was doing. I was following behind her, you know? Um, and so I was getting the messages that I was wrong and I needed to be dieting just like, um, you know, secondhand, right? Versus being told directly, this is what you need to be doing. And so this was sort of my life up until I was in college. And then after college, it was like, okay, I have a professional job. I make adult money and I can actually have like, that was like one of the first times in my life that I had been able to step up out of survival, like hand to mouth um, poverty. And it was just like, okay, how do we, like, how do we do this? How do we get healthy, quote unquote, because that was the message that was happening in the early 2000s. It wasn't so much about being thin. It wasn't like get twiggy. It was get healthy, which meant twiggy, but still, you know, um, we're saying it differently. And so, yeah, that was my journey. Like I was trying to be healthy, quote unquote, at this point in my early 20s um, and mid 20s and most of my 20s. Um, which meant I was looking for ways to be thin. And I remember very specifically, there was an experience at work. There was this really obnoxious guy that I worked with um, who actually himself was a big fat person, but he was one of these people who um, is purposely repugnant because if he rejects you, you will not, if he rejects you first, you will not have the chance to reject him and one day at lunch I he was saying something and I was like hey um this isn't cool and he looked at me and he goes yeah and you're fat and it was so interesting because it was like look I mean it's at lunch at work you know I also I have a background in mechanical engineering so I was working as an engineer I'm one of the few women I was one of the few women working who wasn't you know a secretary or an HR person um, or some kind of other support. Um, I was, I think, one of three female engineers at this place. And like we're at lunch in the middle of the cafeteria surrounded by colleagues and he calls me fat, like, you know, and not like as a whisper. It wasn't like some kind of whispered conversation between the two of us. It's in the middle. Everybody can hear it, you know. Um, and it was the first time that somebody had called me fat directly to my face, meaning to hurt me. And it didn't. And it, it only didn't because it's like, that's the worst you've got for me, that I'm fat. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. And I think that was really interesting because that I can't say that's a turning point for you know, because that didn't send me in a different direction. But it's just like the last time that, or maybe the first time, I don't know, that somebody had levied that at me and it didn't immediately send me into some kind of tailspin. <laughs> but like when I became a health coach, because that's how I started this journey. <laughs> I left my mechanical engineering job behind when I decided to get married and move to be with my husband. 
um, I left my career, my country, my family, everything behind and started living over here in Europe with him because my husband is French. Um, I had to find a new job, a new career, something to do because I can't be a homemaker. Like, that's not my style. I think, what are we calling it today? Trad wife? Like, I'm not. I can't. <laughs> I cannot. That's not who I am. Um, and so I started doing health coaching because I was like, yeah, this is this is something that seems interesting. I had a lot of interest in it. It was, um, it was helping people, you know, and I really enjoy helping people, but there was still the tension. There was tension there because it's like, I am in this body, <laughs> this big fat body and everything I am supposedly that I was taught as a health coach and that I'm supposed to be putting out into the world was literally about making my body the before so that that thinner body you know that woman within question the quote unquote is is what we're going for what we're looking for what we're trying to um to find and and uncover um and like i found health at every size because of the internet yay internet <laughs> yeah i know right sometimes sometimes the internet's a great place um you know again bumbling through garbage but um i found health at every size and that made me have to have this reckoning about like what is my feeling around the word fat and being a person who is fat and so i learned how to destigmatize that word for myself and how to reclaim it and use it like as a descriptor that is completely neutral and factual. Yeah. Yeah. And how did that impact your health coaching dreams? <laughs> oh my. Um, it was very interesting because uh, I remember that I had a I had a friend who we'd gone through the training program together and um we really like you know we were hanging out together like once a week or sometimes more times more than that and like supporting each other um mentally and emotionally and also through like how we get our health coaching businesses off the ground and i remember that i told her that yeah i'm i'm no longer dieting um because she was telling me all about this new diet that she had gone on and how she's now magically wearing this the clothes that she was wearing before she had her children back when she was in college and um and how she's like so excited and maybe I could try it too and I was like oh no I'm not I'm no longer dieting and she's she was like but you're giving up you're giving in and I was like I suppose I am actually um she decided not to talk to me anymore <laughs> which is you know, I mean, it was, it's a bummer and that's the thing is like i there have been people i have lost over time there have been relationships that have been fractured by my embrace of my fatness um and really by embracing my fatness it completely changed my whole point of view. Um, like my whole world changed in so many different ways, but specifically when relating to the health coaching, it was like, okay, I, I can't really do this the way I was taught to do it because it is antithetical to who I am. I cannot embrace my fatness while helping other people lose weight like that's not something that works for me and i mean i guess that there are people who do that and that's fine i suppose you're allowed to i believe in bodily autonomy i don't think you're correct but you do you that's your life and you get to choose what you do with your body um but for me i couldn't make these things match and so it completely changed how i was coaching um and for a while, I actually was calling myself the fat health coach. Um, that was my first brand. But it didn't go so well. 
it didn't go so well. And I don't understand. Maybe I do understand, but um, it doesn't go so, it didn't go so well, partially because I was still in the soup of health looks a certain way, but calling myself the fat health coach, I got so many like high fives. Oh, you're brave. Look at you. You're so audacious. That's so great. But still with like the whole like, yeah, because you're healthy and fat. You know, like you can call yourself fat because you're healthy and fat. We see you performing health. We see you, you know, doing the yoga. We see you with the sweaty shirts and, you know, oh, you did that 5K. Like, we see you with the green smoothies. Like, it's it's so cool. That's awesome. And it's like, oh, hold on. This still isn't working. This isn't actually what I want to be doing. Yeah, yeah. I'm hearing, like, the the morality of healthism kind of showing up in that and also a little bit of the good fatty. I did that for quite some time too. It was like, it's okay. You know, I'm fat, but my blood work is perfect, you know? So, so I'm still okay. Like kind of that, that wanting to um, still be on that body hierarchy ladder close close to the top as I could get right yeah I really relate to that of like and what I'm hearing you so beautifully delineate and I think is what's so relatable for so many of us is like it's there are there are these stepping stones that we that we move through so like you said that moment where being called fat didn't wound you and then the reconcili or not the non-reconciliatory way or i'm just making up words now but then the inability to both be a health coach and be fat positive and you know the principles of health at every size like it, it it doesn't work and then from there it's like oh hang on there's still this new ones it's like there's all these layers that we have to to go through which is maybe why liberation is never done because there's there's just so many layers have been put on us that we have to kind of find our way through and i find now i'm curious if this is true for you as well i'm i'm like oh i figured it all out like i am totally free and then something else will show up and be like oh damn it i just had like that thought show up ah okay there's obviously another layer that needs to be examined so there is this kind of constant excavation (laughs) that i'm that i'm always doing yeah Yeah. I mean, the way I like to refer to that is like, um, you know, we are all conditioned into the world that we live in. And you could also say indoctrinated because it's sort of the same. Um, But we are taught how to live. We are taught what is right and what is wrong. We are taught what is okay and what's not okay. Um, You know, what is desirable and what's not desirable. We are taught these things. Um, And Ultimately, what it comes down to is that regardless of how much work you do to unpack all of these things, to reframe them, to educate yourself around them, that conditioning doesn't go away. I liken this, con- I liken conditioning to a backpack that you are always carrying. So it doesn't matter how far you've gone, it doesn't matter how high you have climbed, how low you have digged, it doesn't matter. None of that matters because that conditioning is always on your back, which means it's always going to be whispering in your ear. You're going to have a bad body day. You're going to have, you know, a moment where some internalized oppression thought comes up. You're going to default back to some habit that you thought you had undone. It's going to happen because as long as the world stays the way it is until the excuse me as long as the world stays the way it is the conditioning will continue and you will always get the the dog whistles the the little you know the ear whistle the ear whistles the one that we don't hear consciously that will always um ping off of the things that are deep in our brains and deep in our conditioning backpack 
you can't get away from it. No, no. Oh, I feel the weight of that, that, you know, as long as, like you said, as long as the world stays as it is, we can never take this backpack off. Tiana, are you hopeful about our world? <laughs> like, is that a, that's a really loaded question, but I'm so curious because I swing radically back and forth like 30 times a day, at least. Like, what's, how do you, how are you? Because again, like, you are, you work as a body liberation facilitator, you work with clients, you run, run groups, like you, this is, you are really in this work. And therefore, I imagine you're really seeing the damage that it causes everyone you work with. And I feel very similarly with my kind of fat liberation clients that I work with. And even like my leadership clients that are in corporate who are in cis white hetero thin bodies, like they are, everyone's being radically damaged. So There's just, I feel like when we work in this field, most of what I do is witness and hold space for harm and then work with the clients to try to find some bit of ease and gentleness and way through. Like, that's that's so fucking hard. (laughs) So are you, how do you feel generally about the world? What brings you hope? What takes away hope? Like, I'm just so curious from your perspective. Mm, this is a great question. I think I have always referred to myself. No, no, I think I know. <laughs> I've always referred to myself as a realistic optimist. <laughs> um, where like I'm not hashtag positive vibes only. That's not my that's not my deal. Um, but I do like to find the joy, find the good work towards kindness and compassion all the time like every like as much kindness as i can put as much compassion as i can have like this guy who called me fat you know like like literally i spent so much time deconstructing him in my head because i'm like did he call me fat because well i mean i am fat (laughs) but but also like you know he was he was literally trying to hurt me he was trying to hurt me but he wasn't specifically just trying to hurt me he was also trying to like continue to be in charge because he doesn't feel like literally like i'm like last cycle analyzing this guy um because i'm trying to understand why he's behaving the way he's behaving um we actually ended up being really good friends um later yeah we hung out quite a lot because he's actually really funny he's a good dude oh, i don't know okay he's a good dude this is this is almost um an oxymoron but but in a way like he was an interesting person and if you could get past the veneer of i'm gonna hurt you before you can hurt me like my dude was soft squishy marshmallow and a good time but you have to get past that you know but you're not going to get past that if you can't hold kindness and compassion for somebody who shows up nasty um and so like yeah (laughs) i'm an optimist insofar as like i don't think that people want to be bad i don't think that that people want to be out here hurting people generally generally and I say people, not not populations or systems or anything like that. People, individuals. I don't think individuals are like, well, today, let's see how many people I can make cry. I don't think there's a lot of people who are doing that when they wake up in the morning. Um, but the realistic part of me is like, but there are people that do. Like, maybe that's not their first thought, but it's going to be their finishing thought after they are going through whatever it is they're going through and the reality of their situation crowds in on them. Um, I do hold hope. I I just don't, I don't think you can do liberation work without hope. Um, Oh my God, no. (laughs) Like you cannot be a liberationist without hope because all liberation work is radical imagination work. It is because none of us know liberation. None of us have ever experienced liberation. And even, for example, um, in my culture, uh, Guam celebrates Liberation Day every year in July. But 
what are we celebrating? We are celebrating the liberation of the island of Guam from the Japanese by the United States. Is this liberation truly, in a sense, yes? And in another sense, absolutely fucking not, because we are now a U.S. territory. We are a modern colony of the U.S. United States empire. Um, We don't have self, you know, like, we don't have self-determination. We can't, uh, there's no sovereignty on the island of Guam because we are beholden to the United States in so many different ways. And, like, we are not an independent nation in any way, shape, or form, really. So, like, were we really liberated? No. We were, they, we had the Japanese thrown off, so that's great. There was no more atrocities um, because of how, things were going down in World War II, no more of that was happening. Great. Except that, for example, my mother, who was born in 1954, was not taught the native language because her mother said, we're American now. My children will not be teased for having an accent. We're American now. So the older children were forbidden from speaking their mother tongue, their native language with the younger children, because we're American now. And so that means that like, I have so much grief around that because I don't have access to parts of my indigeneity because I can't speak the language. And that hurts so much. It has always hurt me. Um, I didn't understand it for many years, but like, it hurts me and it actually is uh, a roadblock between me like fully holding and putting my arms around that part of my identity um, because I always feel other in that way because I'm American, I'm not Chamu. And it's so tough, it's so difficult to deal with. And so like, you know, we don't know liberation. None of us know liberation, not true liberation, because regardless of how fully I am in my body, that I inhabit my physical form, how like uh, unpicked from oppressive systems, my thinking and my being is in the world, I am still oppressed and still conditioned because of the world that I live in. I still live under capitalism. I'm still perceived as a woman and treated less than because of that. I have this color skin, um, and so there's lots of stuff around that. Like, my hair looks like it looks, it's curly, and so that also gives people a different point of view. And and it's like, all of these things are things that I have to contend with uh, when I leave my house. And even inside my house, because my big fat body, hey, chairs are not made for us. They could be, but they're not. So I even have to struggle with just finding physical comfort in my own home. So like, I don't know liberation, not fully. There's no way, Uh, not in the world we live in, but I have hope that we can create it and that we can get there. Will it happen in my lifetime? I don't know. But I hold on to hope because, like I said, my eight-year-old child told me he is on a break. (laughs) I mean, I love the fact that my child has the audacity to say to his parents, who have just asked him to clean up a mess that he made, you know, and he's like, no, no, I'm on a break. (laughs) And it's like, oh, okay. Because number one, this says that my child has an understanding of what it is like to not work. (laughs) Number two, he feels comfortable enough to speak to his parental authority, speak against it, to say no. And like, not in a way that I've ever done in my life where I say no, but like on the inside I'm clenched up because I'm like, am I gonna have to run? 
you know, am I going to have to go hide, lock a door? I don't know. Like, not that way. He was just like, no, no, I'm on, no, I'm on a break. You know, just lay back. Like, I was like, oh, this is beautiful. <laughs> this is beautiful because, because even like as a parent, I'm receiving that with, I mean, there's both and like, there's the frustration of like, but I need you to clean that up because I, I don't want to clean it up. And also I'm trying to teach you that you should clean up after yourself. But on the other hand, going, hell yeah. <laughs> like we have a relationship that he feels comfortable enough in to establish himself as an authority. And I think that's beautiful. And like, I see these glimmers not just in my household with my child, but also out in the world. Like the fact that we are looking at so many horrible things happening in the world and we can see them in detail because of the internet, because of the ubiquity of phones and audio recording equipment and video recording equipment, like, and social media and all of that, we can see things that we never had access to before. Like, I remember watching MTV news back when MTV used to have news and music videos actually be a music channel because I'm old. Um, hello, I'm an old. I'm an old. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember watching them showing these clips of the Berlin Wall falling. And I remember like not understanding it because I think I was Berlin Wall fell what? 1991. So I was like 11, not uh, 10 or 11 years old, something like that. And I remember not understanding it, but I remember seeing it. But like they were the same clips over and over again. You weren't getting anybody who was on the ground's point of view. You weren't getting like, you know, lots of different anything there was no place for me to go and like find out other information or see other people as opposed to today like literally folks in tents on college campuses are making reels and doing lives and taking photos and videos and like posting them for everybody to see people who are like in the middle of a war zone are communicating about what is experiencing, what they're experiencing in that moment in time. And so like, we are seeing things and we are experiencing things that we never would have before. But I still have hope in all of this because people are doing something about it in response to it, you know? And I know that there's, like a hierarchy in a lot of ways. Um, a lot of people say things like being on the internet is an activism. You know, you sending that meme is an activism. I disagree with this because activism doesn't only look one way. Everybody can be an activist if they choose to be. We do not have to march in the parade to be the activist. You can be an activist because you chose to say, sorry, uncle, I don't agree with that. That's harmful. That's enough in the moment. Could you do more? Absolutely. But also, that's activism because that takes something. There's risk involved with that. There's sacrifice involved with that. And I think that those things are the things that are important. Like, Everyone can be an activist and everyone can have a part in it because there are so many different threads in this terrible tapestry of oppression and everyone can just pick and pull just a little bit. You don't have to even pull the whole thread. Just pick and pull just, just a little bit. It loosens everything just a little bit more. Everyone can do that. So sending that meme, is it the pinnacle of activism? Absolutely not but it's what you had access to. It's what you felt comfortable and safe to do. And you did it. Yeah. Yeah, it's your eight-year-old saying, mom, I'm on a break. Exactly. Mama, I'm on a break is activism. Oh, ow. <laughs>
I, I love it so much. <laughs> oh, if if your child starts quoting from "Rest is Resistance," then maybe you have a problem. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, I think we would. That would be great because obviously, so we just concluded a group read. Um, so I do something called the Fat Freedom Group Read, which is it's like a book club, only uh, it's different. <laughs> Mostly because um, it's more about the conversation we're having around the text versus did you read the text? Let's talk about the text. And um and we just finished Rest, Rest is Resistance. Um, so if my child starts quoting from Rest is Resistance, I'm here for it. Yes, yes, yes. So good. Um, speaking of books, you had mentioned that there's a book that you read recently called Sub Subtract, which is about the science of less that's having an impact on you these days. Um, and I was really curious about how that ties in with liberatory work because diet culture in a lot of ways is all about making us less than um, in service of making more money <laughs> for corporations. So yeah, talk to me about this idea of less, the science of less. Yes. So I haven't finished the book, I will say. So there's that. But I don't think you have to finish the book um, in order to have gotten something useful out of the text. Because for me, sometimes what I actually only take from a book is a concept. Um, and so far, like, this book is cool. I really enjoy it. Like, it's really interesting to listen to how they have, um, like, put together this concept and and all of the research because, you know, they're university professors and um, they're, they're doing, like, hardcore, like, actual scientific studies and stuff, which is really neato. Um, but ultimately... Like the concept here is that you can solve a problem in an additive way. So his very simple, um, his very simple starting example is he was building a Lego, building a Lego bridge with his kid, um, with his toddler, and the two sides of the bridge were uneven, and so he turned around to get an extra Lego to even them out. And in the meantime, while searching for that extra Lego that was gonna fit and you know be the proper size, his toddler had taken one away in order to make the two sides even. And he was like, whoa. <laughs> because that is also a valid solution to making the two sides even. And that's the thing is that, um, we think about things generally, I think, with our conditioning. Like, conditioning is, is the first thing that's always going to come up, right? Like, um, that's the purpose of conditioning. Like, it's the knee jerk. It's the, um, the heuristic, you know? But the second thought that comes after that, the, you know, not the reaction, but the response. So the thing that you, that you go, hold on. What can I do here? This is um, where we could try to see if there's a different way to solve a problem by taking something away. And I think that this is this is part of the issue. Is um, here we go. So. <laughs> We live under capitalism, which is about growth. It is about profit over everything. Like, it doesn't matter how we get there as long as we make money. Um, and it's always about more, 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 which then causes us to have to exploit. Capitalism can only happen if we have poverty. We cannot have even... We cannot have everybody has access. We cannot have that and still maintain capitalism because that is antithetical to what capitalism is about. Capitalism is all about extraction. So extraction, making a hole, 
digging, digging, digging. So in some ways, you are subtracting something in order to grow and in order to build. However, there's no sustainability here. That's why we're in late stage capitalism and everything's falling apart (laughs) because there's no sustainability in a system where all you're doing is growing. And so this is something that we tend to do because this is the conditioning that we've received. How do we grow? How do we make it better? How do we make it bigger? How do we do more, more, more? But in actuality, what this guy is talking about in this book is the concept of how do we do less? But not less in so far as like, well, we all have to, you know, eat less. We all have to do less. We all have to accept less. Like not so much that, or not even like, let's be minimalist. <laughs> you know, let's find minimum viable living, you know, um, or, or not even for like, less is elegant, you know, less is more. Like not even with these things, it's, it's really like, how do we get to the same solution without adding a bunch of stuff to it? And I think this is very interesting as a concept because um, I think that's the thing. We default to adding as our solution. Like, oh, we have a problem. Well, how do we build a new bridge to get there? Versus, hold on, what is here that is the mess? What is here that we can actually redo or retool or remake? or unmake that would make it better, you know, that we could get to our solution in the end. And and I think that's the thing is like, this is the thing that I love about this is the fact that diet culture says that you become healthier by physically being less. Except that this is a both and situation somehow where in order to physically be less you have to do so much more because you have to fight your physiology and continually fight your physiology because your body wants to survive and the second that your body sees or senses i should say um senses that there is less caloric intake that there's less food available it literally down regulates metabolism this is what you know when you're a diet culture nerd you every we all know that (laughs) like you know this this is why um you plateau when you diet this is why eventually that weight comes back when you stop restricting 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 restriction doesn't lead to less restriction leads to binging because we like balance nature likes balance and if you're too far on one side you will swing to the other and that's just the way it is so like diet culture says reduce but that reduction requires you to do so much more there was so much more activity that i had to do like not just physical activity like where you know i was exercising and such but like i had to meal plan i had to have specific things in my fridge at all the time in my cabinets all the time like i had to plan things out strategically like like i always had to be thinking about the next thing that i had to do for the food and the exercising and i'd wreck it all and it was crazy um And so it's just ridiculous, right? In the search for reduction, I had to do more. That doesn't make sense. (laughs) This doesn't make sense at all. But in liberation, in finding ways to be free in and with my body, I have been able to subtract. I no longer have to track what I'm eating. I no longer have to track how much I'm moving. I no longer have to strategically plan my meals so that I can save points because I'm going out on Friday night. You know, like there's none of that anymore. Um, I have subtracted all of that emotional and mental labor because now I can just ask myself, what do you feel like? What does your body feel like? 
this is free is an easy no no it's simple it's not easy um it's taken a lot of work and a lot of effort to get there but like liberation work is really about that like how do we get rid of the extra shit because oppression pressure adding pressure you only get pressure when you add stuff you know and to release pressure release you have to let go of something you have to open a valve and let some of that out into the atmosphere and so like how we get to places where we're more free is to let go of expectations let go of harmful ways of thinking let go of harmful ways of being let go <laughs> let go yeah yeah i really resonate with that Subtra yeah i thank you for framing that that's such a really that's so essential the way you've just described that it's like oh yeah right i in or i I went through a process of letting go of all of that and feel more free than I ever have. Yeah, that's so interesting that you just connected the dots for me on all of that. Thank you. You're welcome. That's what I do. Yeah, <laughs> you do it well. You do it well. Um, this is so neat. It's such a, it's a way of framing liberation work that I've not heard before. So I'm really... Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna sit with that because now, of course, my my slight hyperachiever is like, what else can we subtract? What else could I let go of? What else? I mean, really, and the question is, as always, like, what am I still holding on to that is not in service of me? So, what can I let go of? No, absolutely. And, and the thing is, like, honestly, how much do we have to hold on to in order to be dominant? in order to have hierarchy, in order to be oppressive. How much do we have to hold on to? Like, we can't just let people be, you know? We're terrible at that. Exactly. You can't just be who you are. We have to put all this stuff on you. Um, we have to carry around all of these ideas and ways of thinking, expectations and obligations. We have to carry all of that around in order to maintain oppression. So I have a preconceived notion of who you are before you even open your mouth, before you even breathe in my area. Because I'm looking at you, I have to go into the catalog of my head and bring out all of the things that I have been pre-assigned to you and the identities that I perceive. That's exhausting. Right. And it also re removes curiosity completely, which is one of my big bugaboos, bugbears with, you know, and it, I, I, I th I'm sure my clients get very tired of me being like, and what, you know, let's get curious about that. What, uh, what are the different assumptions you're holding? How can we think about that differently? What's showing up for you there? What's possible? Like it really, those, I think you, is this, I don't know if this is the right word. You tell me, the heuristics is that does heuristic mean like the representative of the pattern like a like a shortcut yeah a shortcut thank you yeah i think that's where yeah where we just we de and all these shortcuts that have been given to us are not like they're rooted in oppression it's like fat equals lazy okay great awesome fat equals unhealthy yay you know like it's 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 so deep in there and it doesn't have to be it doesn't have to be. Oh, I'm loving that you're continuing to point this conversation towards imagination because I, I'm such a doer. That's just I'm wired as a doer, and I have that means I find. And whereas my husband's an artist and a dreamer, and he lives in imagination, and I envy that because I really struggle with imagination, and so I have a really hard time imagining a world, a space, a moment um, that is liberated. I keep I keep looking for who has written the book that paints the world 
that is liberated. And I haven't, I haven't quite found it yet. So if anyone listening knows of a book where it is like, here's what it's like to live in a liberated world. I want to read that book because I, I can't imagine it. And so I love that you've continued to point to this idea of how liberatory work requires hope and also imagination. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, like, I just finished a, uh, a trilogy <laughs> this today um, that I've been reading with my ears for the past few weeks because I'm reframing that. Audiobooks are not audiobooks are not a separate activity. Audiobooks are reading with your ears, people. It is not lesser. It is not lesser. No, I don't know why. Why do we think that? That's so bizarre to me. But yes, you're right. Like, it's you're still imbibing a book. Why does it matter how you did it? I mean, if someone is using their fingers to read through Braille, does that mean that's lesser? No, right? Exactly. Exactly this. I mean, you know, the, the answer to the question, I, I find it funny because I'm like, oh no, you're insufferable, Tana, because I'm the person who goes, I can actually answer that question for you. Um, and really like, you know, if we boil it all down, the answer is white supremacy culture. But, you know, but the reality is there's a hierarchy. We have to have hierarchies because we are conditioned to look at hierarchies. Hierarchy says that the best reading is that literally you have the hardcover because it means you can afford it somehow. Um, but but ultimately, like, let's get rid of the hierarchy. We don't need this hierarchy. Reading is reading is reading. Like, and hey, accessibility for people who cannot sit down. They don't have the luxury, the liberty, the the time or capacity to sit down or lay down or whatever with a physical book because life and situation audiobooks make things more accessible. In addition, the benefit of audiobooks is it's like, it's like listening to a play. It's a radio play. It's great. Love it. I love audiobooks. Yeah, I'm with you. I'm with you. I just finished one today um, called the Chasing Graves Tril Trilogy, if you're interested. Um, yeah, I, I like this kind of thing. But basically, um, the thing that I find interesting about it is that it ended with like the fairy tale ending and everybody you know like and happily ever after and i hate this um it's common it's super common and i understand why it's common it's common because that's what we know that's the best that we can get right literally we were liber guam was liberated by the united states and they live happily ever after except that we don't talk about what happens after right there is however um Octavia Butler did explore what happens after. Oh, in the Lilith's Brood books? Oh, God, Lilith's Brood. Ugh. Loved those books. Oh, honestly, genius, genius. Yeah. It's so good. If you haven't read Octavia Butler, read Octavia Butler. And um, like, it's going to take you to some places. And I'm sorry. <laughs> but um, she, her writing is, uh, is amazing. Like, um, she has this series one of the books is called imago i always mess this up because i always forget the name of the trilogy but like it's a trilogy of books and um it's it's imago is one of the books and basically it's about like human beings meet aliens and it's weird <laughs> it's so weird but i just like found it delightful um but she but she's talking about what happens after you know and i and i find this really interesting because like science fiction is a genre that goes to the after um i am currently on waiting just waiting for the next to come out i hate when this happens um of another series uh i think it's six books so far i think i read six books but it's called the red rising series um and it is beautiful because it is i think it began as a trilogy i just learned that from a friend it began as a trilogy which was here's how we get to the revolution here's how the revolution started but then the second three books four five and six are about what happens after what happens during and after? Like, we're talking about what happens after the revolution. So not just about the dismantling. Right. That Because that's what I want. How do we rebuild differently and not repeat all the same mistakes? Because as Octavia Butler says, we are so flawed as humans because we are intelligent and we believe in hierarchy. 
And that is our undoing, those two things. And so like, how do we, how do we not? Exactly. How do we not? Yeah. All right. The Red Rising. I'm totally going to check that out. Thank I you. Love it. Okay. I, you know, content warning for those things or content note, I should say, they are very violent and very explicit in their violence. I think some of it's gratuitous. It's written by a man. So there's that. But um, I think the characters are very believable. They are not so tropey. <laughs> you know, they 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 feel more human, more real, more um, more well rounded, and they have flaws. It's great. It's great. Gosh, that's, that feels so basic. It's like these characters have flaws, and it's like, what? <laughs> Why are you excited about that? And it's like, yeah, I like I like human human characters you know um but i what i really love is that they're really talking about the fucking boring shit really which is how do we reconstruct society after tearing it the fuck down and i think it's beautiful let's do more of this yeah i love that i often will imagine this sounds really this sounds very dark, but I often imagine like I am maybe one of a hundred survivors in this world at some point. Let's say something horrible happens and I'm always, I kind of do this little thought experiment where it's like, okay, so what will happen? What will my role be? Who do I want to be in that kind of organize, newly forming organizational structure? Um, how would I resist people trying to claim power. Like, it's just, it's a very interesting, and this is where I I think I do this because I'm trying to grow my imagination because I'm I'm quite like very, I'm very literal. Again, I'm a doer. I'm like, give me a spreadsheet, give me a to-do list, but I want to stretch my imagination a little bit. And given that my work in this world is about understanding and working with people, I kind of play with that a little bit. And I it gives me a bit of hope. It gives me a thought. It's like, okay, so if, if we can imagine different, then we can do different, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, and that's the thing is like, you can't like, uh, I don't know who this, who says this, but like, you know, it's, it's, it's really common, but it's like our thoughts become actions. Um, and like imagination is all about thinking, but also like we need not to, uh, cut ourselves off at the neck with our imaginations. Like, bring your body into that as well, right? How does that feel? Because, because like, that's the thing, like, when I'm listening to some of the really kind of more boring passages of the Red Rising trilogy, when they're talking about, like, these are the things that are happening. Like, I mean, it's an, it's entertaining because the writer is talented, but, um, I, you know... Nobody watches C-SPAN for fun. Or if you are watching C-SPAN for fun, good for you. But uh, but like C-SPAN is not like, oh, I need some entertainment. Let's turn this on. I want to watch what's going on in the U.S. Senate. Like nobody is like, let's do that. Like nobody's doing that. And because it's boring. It's, it, there's nothing really... I mean, if you love policy and watching policy happen do you but most of us don't want that we don't want to watch that and that's the thing is like we need that but also we need to feel into like i think a really great way to do this actually is to stay where you are right like maybe you can't imagine yourself in the future you can't project that for lots of different reasons because i know that for example if you have trauma body-based trauma or or like um you're you're just looking at what's going on in the world right now and you're just like i have no idea how we're gonna get to the other side and that's fine i you know if that's where you are that's where you are babe and look it is what it is and i have no judgment about that but if you can't imagine yourself into the future feel yourself into where you are now um and go as deeply as is safe for you. So I will not prescribe for you what this needs to look like, but just like find a scenario and feel into it. Did I 
like standing in line at the bakery today? You know, did I enjoy that experience? Did I like how the cashier talked to me? Did I enjoy that interaction? You know, and and like this way we can think as well as feel into what's actually going on right now. Because I think that that's the thing is like, um, we all have the power to change things, regardless of how unempowered we might feel or be told that we are. And so ultimately what it comes down to is like, we can start with what we are experiencing, what our actual lived experience is, We don't have to cast ourselves into the stars, into, you know, 2217. We don't have to do that. We can actually think about our actual current lived experience. I am parenting a child. And the basis of my parenting is, how do I create a relationship with this person that I created with my body that does not mirror the one that I have with my own parents? How do I create a relationship with this child where when that child is my age, if we make it that far, that that child still enjoys me and my company? Not out of obligation, not out of blood is thicker than water, not out of any of that, but because he's like, I like my mama. What is she up to? Let's let's talk. That's what I want to create. So that could be, you know, like that there is an act of imagination there. Absolutely. But if thinking about imagination gives you agita or, or makes you feel some sort of way because, you know, you you don't think you're that kind of person, that's, that's fine. Think about what you have experienced or what you are experiencing and how you can make it feel better. Yeah. That's such a great exercise. I really love that. I'm going to take that and play with that. Thank you. Because I I think I think there's so many, I imagine people listening to are like, oh, that's a great way to, gent- like I f- it feels very gentle too, like gently examine what is true about the here and now and what I might want to be different. And that is the liberatory imagination. Yeah, I love that. Um, Tiana, I'm really curious. The last question I always ask guests is about joy. What do you think joy is? Ooh, what do I think joy is? Yeah, I know. I keep, I know I keep trying to figure it out. So I figure someone's going to know. <laughs> Somebody. Yes. We, we will all put, we put all together. We'll co-create this idea. I think joy is a feeling of uh, synonyms, pressure, pleasure. Joy is a feeling of pleasure, like where it time sort of stops and everything feels like it belongs in this moment. Mm-hmm. I love that. Yeah. I, I spoke yesterday, I recorded yesterday with Kate Mann, who's the author of Unshrinking. And we were talking about joy and she goes, you know, I think she goes, if I, and she's a philosopher, which was so fun to talk to a philosopher. I was like, let me give you all my philosophical, really hard, unanswerable questions. Um, and what she said was very similar to what you just said. She said, I think joy is pleasure plus meaning. Ooh, yes. Right? Because like, pleasure but then like what's the meaning that that pleasure represents and i i loved that like added layer and that equals joy and i was like oh yeah yeah anyway so i th- i just thought that was so interesting what are some of the things that you choose that bring you joy ooh i choose to be fat and embrace it that gives me joy. I have like a desire to make sure that fat people have space in this world, right? And doing that work really brings me quite a lot of joy where I am 
not necessarily glorifying obesity, um, as some people would term it, but um, but basically where like fatness just is part of the world and there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. Um, I choose joy like in squishing my fat, in squeezing my fat, in feeling the sensuality of the fatness, the roundness, the softness, the warmth of fat. And oh my God, it jiggles. Right. What's more fun than that? <laughs> right. Oh, uh, so beautiful, Tiana. Thank you. Um, this has been such a really beautiful and like profound conversation. I feel I'm really I have a bodily feeling of of kind of like floating in deep waters with you. So yeah, thank you. I'm just yeah, I just feel like I'm in it. I love that. I see feeling. sun and moon. <laughs> right. <laughs> Um, yeah, this was such a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much for, um, for sharing your wisdom with us. Thank you for having me. It has been definitely a joy to hang out and have this chat. Before we go, I'd like to read a poem because poetry can reach our hearts in a different way. Poems can have us feel in a different way. And that's what this podcast is all about, expanding our hearts, deepening our empathy, and inviting in joy. So each week, you get a new poem. I really love how in this conversation with Tiana, there's so much exploration of perspectives and how we can view things through different lenses, and that gives them different meaning. So the poem I've chosen to read for this episode is called The Broken by Alberto Rios. Something is always broken. Nothing is perfect longer than a day. Every roof has a broken tile, every mouth a chipped tooth. Something is always broken, but the world endures the break. The broken twig is how we follow the trail. The broken promise is the one we remember. Something changed is pushed out the door. Sad, perhaps, but ready, too ready for the world. Something is always broken. Something is always fixed. Thank you for joining me today. My hope is that you're feeling a little less alone and a little more seen. So until the next episode, you can find me on Instagram at fatjoy.life, on YouTube at youtube.com slash at fatjoy, and on Substack at fatjoy.substack.com. And please do check out the episode notes for how you can connect with my amazing guest and for the links to the poem. All right, lovely, I am sending you off with my best wishes for an abundantly fat joy day, and we'll talk again soon.